Center for Latin American Studies, known as Young Class of Harvard University. Today's event is entitled Cora Montgomery filibuster between Cuban annexionism and the U.S. expansionism. And we do it in cooperation with the Spanish and Portuguese Department of the Berkeley uh, University. My name is Tania Bruguera. I am the interim uh, director of the Cuban Studies Department. And while our director Alejandro de la Fuente is in a sabbatical, I am very pleased on behalf of Alejandro as well introduce those of us that will be joining us today. Our main speaker is Dailet Dominguez, Wilbur Martner Visiting Scholars here at Dr. Class Harvard and Associate Professor at the Spanish and Portuguese Department of UC Berkeley. As a speaker, as a co-moderator, we will have Marial Iglesias Utset, Visiting Research Scholar at the African Re uh, Diaspora Research Group. And she's a, she was a professor of philosophy and history at the University of Havana for 25 years. Thank you so much, Dailet, for the introductions. Before passing the floor to Dailet, I would like to ask the audience to please uh, be mindful of the chat to um, know about the simultaneous interpretation services provided. Also, we ask you to please enter your questions throughout the presentation. There is a section that reads Q and questions and answers or preguntas y respuestas. So please enter your questions so we can have them there available. And once the presentation is done, we can pass them to the speakers. I would also like to thank Jimena for continuing with this project, Dale for the simultaneous interpretation, and Evelyn for her attendance. So without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Dailet. And thank you so much, Dailet, for sharing your research project with us. Thank you so much, Tania, for the kind introduction and Maria for joining us today. I am very glad to be with you today. I also want to thank Jimena for inviting me and for all of the work that has been done behind the scenes. And I would also like to thank everyone joining us today. This presentation is part of my new project where I am interested in thinking about the alliances between the Cuban expansionism, uh, the US expansionism and the Cuban annexationism. And in this case, alliances happen by Jane Casno via Jane Casnell, and under the pseudonym of Cora Montgomery, she became in the, ma uh, the main editor of the Cuban uh, journal La Verdad. She supported the Cuban filibustering movement, and probably she's turned into one of the very few women that have led a strictly political uh, journal in the 19th century. My presentation will be divided into two parts. The first part, well, I am very interested in visibilizing Casno as a bridge figure between these two movements. And the second part, I would like to uh, to go back to some of uh, the historians when approaching La Verdad. Well, whether they just uh, leave her be behind or beside, or they just uh, reduce her to the person that's in charge of the English department to do uh, the translator of Cuban writers. So I would love to visualize her interventions because her interventions made it to the headers of uh, the journal, uh, uh, the newspaper. So I would like to share my screen now so I can properly begin. Very well, so Cora Montgomery, Philip Buster. Despite the fact that filibustering was constituted as an evidently male movement from the beginning, it had the participation of Jane Casno, considered the North, most important North American journalist of the first half of the 19th century. She's an expert in international affairs and collaborator of the New Yorker Democratic Review and New York Song. It is very probable as the historian and biographer has uh, stated 
uh, that she wrote the annexation is in 1845, where the first for the first time, the Stino Manifesto is used, and Mr. Sullivan was the director of the Demographic Review, so it was attributed for him, but it is not uh, accurate. And if it's okay, then you are interested, we can later discuss on how this conclusion, this mistaken conclusion was uh, reached. So the text that defined the expansionist rhetoric in the U.S. was written by them. So Casno was the first in organizing a campaign in the New Yorker press to convince the public opinion of the importance of incorporating Cuba to the U.S. Between December 1846 and March 1847, as a result of her first stay at the island, Casno covered 15 uh, sketches in order to familiarize U.S. and the Antilles. And Gasno, that was in Cuba, had been sent to Mexico by President James in order to meet a sort of diplomatic secret mission and negotiate peace between the U.S. and Mexico. And the mission was a success. And as of that moment, she was, uh, she figured in the international U.S., uh, overview, so she was also validated as a political writer. And in the summer of 1847, once again, she stops in Cuba. And at that moment, when she was meeting with the Cuban annexionism, she accepted to become the main editor of La Verdad. And if La Verdad turned into the most important Cuban annexationist speaks a person published at the end of the 40s and during the decade of the 50s in the US, it was because it had not only the journalistic effort of important writers such as Gaspar Betancourt Cisneros, Terbe Tolón and Villaverde, now the latter were incorporated to the newspaper when it already has a very strong uh, reputation in the Cuban and American audience, but not because of that, but because of the beginning, it was sustained by the talent of Casno, and she had a huge experience in New York press as a political editor and a journalist. Despite its importance, many literary critics and historians have approached La Verdad not even thinking about that it was mainly done by uh, Casno. However, they believe that it was only a group of annexationists, Cuban annexationists that were settled in New York, along with Sullivan and Moses <coughs> and Beach, the ones that bring it forward. But when they actually mention her, they reduce her function and effort to a mere translation effort of the journals Cubans writers. A sort of similar situation happened to her intellectual history and the American cultural legacy that she left. Because of course, today uh, she's uh, a great representative of anonymity since she published most of her articles under different pseudonyms so she could cover up her real name. According to Megan Griffin, Casno would use more than 12 pseudonyms throughout her journalistic career. But among them, the one that she used the most to publish her text in favor of annexation was Montgomery, Cora Montgomery. My interest in placing her along with a series of male figures, both Cuban and American, is because her joining would make the Cuban annexationism more complex because of three reasons. First of all, it would allow questioning the fact that the uh, Destino Manifiesto was considered as a narrative that was eminently male. Her case reveals the participation of women in the configuration of a national discourse is of course, highlighted by expansionist rhetoric and uh, with the design of domestic and foreign <clears throat> political affairs in the country's largest development. Secondly, her work in favor of Cuban annexation reoriented in some way the, vi the geopolitical vision of the US expansionism 
facing the idea of expanding the borders towards the west. So Casno promoted the expansion towards the south, passing from a continental approach to an ultra sea approach. Thirdly, her close collaboration with Cuba showed the need to study annexionism not as an isolated aspect of the US, but in close relation with internal and external policies in North America. Under the pseudonym Cora Montgomery, Casno turned into the most important voices of the Cuban annexationism. And uh, she also started the Joint America movement that was consolidated at the end of the 40s. It was a literary and political movement in charge of renewing the Democratic Party at that time in favor of free trade, territorial expansion, the incorporation of social reforms, uh, placing uh, wom wom women in society. And actually some of these movements also mentioned the anti-slavery movement in the Democratic Party. And some of them afterwards actually were the creators of the Republican Party in 1844 in opposition of the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act. The fact that she acted as the two movements speaks woman it showed that these uh, political views were simultaneously developed and they shared many common places. Casno was able to bring together the U.S. expansionist interests and the Cuban annexationists and promoted a hemispheric alliance based in Republican moral, representing Cubans and the followers of the American uh, Republican idea as the uh, American identity. So Cuba was part of the American family because we were inside the American geography and belong in the white race. Her work as a writer of La Verdad uh, also shows how these alliances were organized along with expansionism figures. So Casno bet on turning humans in her main allies. With the support of them, the incorporation of the island was legitimate and became into an easier uh, thing to justify as an international movement. In that sense, it was, it was facilitated by the uh, expansionism and the Cuban annexationism. So. <clears throat> President James Falk, for example, and James Buchanan, and Mirabel Amar, George Bancroft, and Eric Bourne was all were also in favor of it. And it's very probable that the idea of having one of the main generals involved so they could uh, re free Cuba from Spain, and this is because they had a great connection with the Texan world. And Cubans were also able to start uh, working with the U.S. to find uh, people that favored the movement to help them fight against Spain. So despite being able to uh, deny annexationism, uh, saying that it was anti-patriotic, well, they also thought that it could add to Mexico or Colombia as the only ways that they could carry out a separation from Spain. At the end of the 40s, these political projects that were also part of nationalism were articulated through the United States. From the expansion in empire, Cubans defended separating, separating from Spain, appealing both to the annexation as well as the independence of the island. Now, these two options appear to be contradictory. However, they were used exchangeably in the text of the time due to the American politics that promoted the independence of the states within the Confederation. The alliance was uh, carried out from different fronts. On one part, Cubans were committed to reimburse the American government until $100 million, up to $100 million for buying Cuba from Spain and financing the journalistic work in favor of U.S. annexation. The funds for La Verdad came from the Cuban Hacienda owners that uh, were the core of the Habana Club. On the other hand, they would become in to defend in the indispensable defenders of the American expansionism and promoted some arguments that would be uh, critical for the 
messianic notion of destino manifesto, the idea of the American exceptionalism based on the Republican ideals. So also the utopian uh, promoter and the uh, way it was associated to the expansionist spirit was facilitated by the emancipating rhetoric promoted by Cubans. The argument was uh, uh, that predominated uh, among these movements was in favor of the annexation. And the idea was to free the island from the despotic Spanish power. Casno would identify the expansionist leaders uh, with this narrative and represent them as uh, freers of one of the main remaining uh, flagships of colonialism, of European colonialism in the Americas. Now, unlike the local circulation, the journal studied by Anderson and Destin to promote a simultaneous conception of time and space, as of which uh, throughout the 19th century, the idea of nation would be stated. The truth is written in a transnational circuit that uh, defies borders and eventualities. Conceived from the Havana and materialized in Nueva York, in New York, it became one of the most important uh, journals that was bought before 1865 and the one that lasted the most. So it would be edited from 12 years consecutively. And it was also a project in which pages many readers could find different interest. On one hand, we have the Anglo audience that lived in New York. And also on the other hand, we would have people living on the island that was also a Cuban audience. So it was not about the Cubans recognizing themselves in a time that was similar, but for Cubans, Puerto Ricans and the US to think themselves as part of a future community where Spanish and English could coexist. The use of both languages would connect with the transnationals aspect of the newspaper and many times it also went on their translation services and it became a way to break the cultural gaps that would separate the US and Q uh, Americans and Cubans and it would create a new geopolitical space that would be integrated along with the US. From the first number of La Verdad, the first issue, uh, she was the editor. As you can see here, on this uh, header of the issue in Spanish. This was one of the first issues. You can read La Verdad by Cora Montgomery. And afterwards, you see the logo that would be the header in English that also recognized that as Cora Montgomery as the uh, newspaper's editor. This is only interrupted by a brief period of time from August to October, 1852, when the name of Cora Montgomery was along uh, with uh, other editors such as Cirilio Villaverde. But as of uh, October 1852, she's again the independent editor. Despite her pseudonym, the, her, the recovery has been uh, affected by silence. Now, Jose Ignacio Rodriguez, uh, Rodriguez did a uh, major story on Cuban annexationism. He wrote it from the US as of the sixth decade of the 21st century. So it's very possible that she read the news, that he read the newspaper and knew about the existence of Cora Montgomery. However, she doesn't, he doesn't even mention her name despite of that. So the Cora Montgomery pseudonym was added in the Cuban pseudonym dictionary in the 20th century by Domingo Figaro La Canela. But uh, the, pro the origin was not really clear because they didn't know if Caspar Betancourt Cisneros or Miguel Turbetolón had uh, made her up or if Cora Montgomery was actually the American journalist that had acted as the editor of the newspaper facing North American rules. For the historian, it was not a pseudonym. It was the true name of the writer. And mistakenly, uh, because Miss was the owner of the New York Sun and she worked for him, she was the political editor. So he reduced her functionalities to the section in English. Now you could uh, 
conclude that not using her own name made it harder to recover her place in La Verdad newspaper. But this time uh, is not enough to understand uh, the silence that has existed surrounding their personality. Cora Montgomery, uh, using her name, would actually make people realize that she was the writer of many books, history texts and traveling books, and even a novel that was published with the pseudonym of Cora Montgomery. For example, she used the name of Corinne Montgomery first, but in the King of Rivers, well, Queen of Islands and the King of Rivers, she already used Cora Montgomery. And uh, the fact that almost all of the articles in La Verdad uh, appeared without her signature uh, helped the cause because Casno uh, would uh, use her pseudonym without really signing it. So it would make it harder to visibilize her place. But uh, it was because we are in a presence of a woman that does political uh, movements, uh, started political movements, and under her direction, she grouped the most relevant poets and writers from Cuba in that generation. When La Verdad became stronger, most of the historians were looking for the Abets and Cisneros's and Metolon's uh, footprint, but they tend to leave besides behind Cora Montgomery. It would have been enough to look at the uh, journalistic pieces that she published in Queen of Islands. There are many of them that already had appeared previously in the newspaper. I'm going to show you one of those that were published independently and that can be seen in the newspaper. Here we have three of them. The first is Cuba and her destiny, and there are two more. I have just brought you the principles that were actually on the first pages of the newspaper at the time. And it is very interesting to see that the first one, Cuba and her destiny, you can see here, it was published first in the New York Sun. And another one is, called uh, yes, Will and Accession of Cuba add uh, to the strength, but there was also another one called Cuba, the key of the Mexican Gulf. And as you can see, it was published with the initial CM. That's the way it appeared on the newspaper. So as of this first corpus, we can set up we can configure a journalistic corpus that belongs to Cora Montgomery that has been discussed by the literary critique as part of Cuban annexationism. It always ends up in pseudonyms and its usage. And these first interventions that were easily identifiable visibilize other texts that only appeared in the newspaper. For example, when you read a Cuban destiny in the context of La Verdad, we see that first it was published in New York Sun, and there are many articles that are in La Verdad and that they were published first in the New York Sun, and it is recognized that they were published there. So it is very easy now to know that they were by Cora, and many of them were translated into Spanish. And as you can see here in this second article, it is signed by Montgomery. This is a newspaper section that repeats itself where she writes and appears as a lobbyist. She is appealing to the Congress because she is lobbying many aspects. So specifically here, she signs as Montgomery, but there are many others in her newspaper where she appears anonymously, but it is also easy to uh, know that she was uh, the author. They are in English, so they reveal that they should, uh, she was a translator, yes. However, the newspaper in English had her its own identity. And she also shared many articles that only circulated in that uh, language. So the texts were not only translated into Spanish, it was also necessary to write them down, taking into account the interests and the journalistic style of that audience. So that's why her role was so important. And it is very interesting when you compare the articles and, and very easy to recognize when the article has been written by a Cuban, which is because of the rhetoric. And there is also a will to recreate a Cuban independent story. And Cubans many times bet for numbers, statistics, 
and a commercial discourse looking for revealing the economic advantages of the Cuban annexation. But as we see this uh, newspaper, it is not only possible to think that she was only in charge of the English text. Also, the Spanish aspect helps understand her place, her role in La Verdad. When written in that language, it has been believed that all of the articles appearing in Spanish were fruit of Cuban writers. However, in the first six months of the newspaper, Casno had an active participation, uh, basically by herself, where a uh, nor Villaverde nor Peta were already there. And we had in August in 48, uh, uh, Villaverde joining the newspaper. Now, Casno had a very active act activity in her interventions in the Spanish section. There are many aspects that tell that she was the author in these initial stages of the newspaper. There are many articles, for example, where the journalistic, journalistic voice uses ours in order to refer to the American government and positions from a North American perspective. And uh, those writings feel uh, at ease when, of course, asking to the New York government uh, and, well, the American government to turn to look at the text. I want to share uh, an excerpt of the political uh, journal. I'm going to very briefly read these two quotes. And the first one says, what will our government do? The, will they second the movement and the popular will, or will they listen to their loyals and the noble uh, demands oh, for comfort for Ireland and other neighboring countries and towns of our family that were tyrannized by Ireland? And this, what I brings my attention is our government because their neighbors are Cuba and Puerto Rico. So I'm very interested in seeing how they use the rhetoric of the family, our family. She uses our family to talk about Cuba and Puerto Rico. The next quote is, uh, the, the fate of Cuba that could affect political and trade interest of the US is today in the hands of our government and it should, Respond. So once again, the use of the possessive pronoun and to demand from the government. So these interventions were in the most important uh, headers of uh, the English and Spanish issue of the newspaper, and it was demanding the government. So this was the main destination of this text. So in both languages, it is very hard to determine if they were written first in English to then be translated into Spanish. We don't know if she would be in charge of uh, translating into Spanish or if Cubans would be involved in the translation efforts. For an article to be published only in Spanish on May 14, 1848, it became quite revealing. And the title is Cuba and its future. And uh, talking about Cubans in the third person and questioning them. And then I want to read them because it says, what does Cuba Island needs to start this career of, uh, of power and glory and richness that appears to be called fate, its destiny? What is it missing? Only the will of its inhabitants, the US, whatever the demands and the cries of Cuba, Praise for their independence, their annexation cannot stop supporting the call for the annexation from Cuban inhabitants. Uh, these are the ones that, because of the delay of its demands, has caused the U.S. to become hand-tied. So it actually asks, she actually asks, how can the so-called editors like Cisneros uh, wouldn't have filtered this. I mean, everyone should have been aware of this. So the fact of this type of articles making it to the light would reveal that Casno was leading the editorial at least in the first months, including the Spanish section. So it is possible to also imagine the tensions 
that this caused amongst Cubans. And all seems to indicate that the intervention was reduced with Miguel's arrival by the end of 1848, because a transformation was starting at the insides of the newspaper. In the first six months, there is a very particular identity. Cuba was placed in a global context and in conversation with the first economical situations, uh, political and economical in the world, uh, all of the American president's speeches were translated and the, the North American politics were followed closely, as well as the debates and the proposals happening in Congress. And this would change with the arrival of Torbe Tolón because it turned towards Cuba. It became more local. Many articles related to the uh, journalistic situation of the island were uh, uh, published. But before, we would only know about them due to the Cuban uh, writers sending letters to uh, be aware of them. So. Gaspar Betancourt Cisneros was actually behind of all of these letters that would be published in Spanish and that were also in English. So afterwards, we are going to have new sections because Beto, uh, we had uh, also Don Juan's uh, custom reason, uh ideas were also uh, included and circulated in the newspaper, as well as the poetry of Torbe Tolón. So Marcelo is not, and I haven't been able to find more information about Marcelo Edna, but he wrote in English and in Spanish. And he also appears with pseudonyms, Siboney, Lola, that was the pseudonym that Turbe uh, Tolon also used. And by the end of 1848, the first columns in English and in Spanish appear to be the result of Casno's writing, not only because they are considered from an American perspective, but because they are targeting the American worker. And the tone that predominates is uh, trade, commerce. At the end, uh, they would also be shown in the English section without a Spanish translation. And with this, I would like to conclude to the question of Rodrigo Lasso. Where does the filibuster find this Cuban movement? We have to respond, visibilizing the place, the role that Casno played. And uh, the admirer of Lopez turned into one of the main figures of the Cuban uh, writing in the second half of the 20th century. And it is very probable that at some point uh, she was inspired by the New York filibuster that would write on both languages under the pseudonym of Cora Montgomery. And yes, actually Mila Casanova Villaverde knew this and since she was an admirer, she was able to reach this conclusion. And now I would like to pass the floor to the moderator. Thank you so much, Dailet. I would like to thank you for introducing me to a fascinating figure, a fascinating person. I was familiar with the story of annexionism and I have read everything I could find online from La Verdad but I didn't know about Cora Montgomery. I think that your work has been a detective-like type of effort, a very interesting one from the point of view of her texts. It was a woman working with two languages, uh, with two cultures, two countries, and becoming a bridge a uh, liaison between two different political cultures, two different geographical spaces. So it is a fascinating newspaper, you know? And I think that it, there are many things that have been published lately, for example, Lasso's book and the book of Lisandro Otero. Sorry, Lisandro Perez, Lisandro Teresa, another Lisandro. Uh, these are also fascinating. 
on the Cuban community in New York, but this different approach is from the optic of literature, from the point of view of literature. So I am very surprised that in your case, well, a woman that is so visible as a journalist and that is so well connected in Washington, well, you didn't have that much time to talk about her life, right? Her biography, but her biography is just amazing. I mean, she was the daughter of a New York lawyer. So she was born being well connected with a series of power circles in New York as well as becoming a commercial empire for and it became the political power the financial political power and capital of the US actually and there was also a presence of interests related to Cuba because New York was turning into the main a sugar uh, exporter to US. So uh, it was called actually South Street, you know, the low Manhattan, where there were counting houses, Cuban counting houses, that were sugar, Cuban sugar importers with North American representatives. And many of them had an active presence in New York doing businesses. So if you consider and map the New York of those Cubans, it's only some blocks away from Wall Street. So many of these people behind the truth, such as Cristobal Mara, had very strong interests invested in the sugar business. At the middle of the 19th century, Cuba imported half, at least half, of the sugar that was consumed in the US. So we are not talking about the secondary market here. And Cora Montgomery, of course, besides being a journalist, she also did businesses. She also had businesses. And this was something that I wanted, I would like for you to please elaborate her political profile and also the fact that she was an entrepreneur. She was a pioneer. And well, you didn't mention it because your topic is on something else. However, she was also a pioneer of Texas colonization by buying land, trying to bring a German migrants to Texas so they could populate Texas. She was also fundamental in the negotiation between the US and Mexico. And the way the war with Mexico was solved, afterwards she was involved in the North American intervention with Nicaragua, secondarily uh, with Walker, right? And afterwards she moved to Dominican Republic where she bought land, she invested in mines, and at the end of her life, she bought plantations actually. What had been a plantation at least that had already been abolished in Jamaica. Uh, slavery wise I'm talking about so her life is not only the pen you know it's a woman she's a woman that was writing articles not as uh, an spectator but as an active main character of the North American uh, expansionism and when you map her uh, travelings and where she lived she is, it, it is a sort of a summed up version of the different aspects in the area that surrounds the US where we have expansionist policies that will be uh, qualified as the foundation of the North American imperialism. So I think that we would have to elaborate a little bit more on this dichotomy between the pen, the writing woman, and publishing woman as a political project and how this is interrelated to the expansionism aspect as well. So the question that I wanted to ask is, 
what do you think about the limits, the boundaries between these two aspects being not only uh, an active uh, political uh, academic, but also you already talked about she being the first journalist uh, being out on the field reporting from site, which is of course completely unprecedented at that time for a woman. Uh, I think she was a lobbyist by excellence, uh, having relationships uh, in the circles of power in Washington, in the financial circles of power, especially with the Democrat Party. And she used this to her advantage. So it would be great if you could please elaborate on the different role of the womb, of, of, of women in the 19th century. I don't know if you know, but 1848, there was uh, the first a Congress of women that were suffragists, that were fighting for the rights of women so the history of feminism and North American suffragists is overlapping as no uh, story, history as lobbyist, as a colonialist by inland in Texas and intervening in Dominican Republic. So if you could please tell us a little bit about how she expanded the limits of the role of women in the US uh, an interpretation for better or for worse, because many times we see women, we see uh, people of color as people that are just uh, the margin, you know, because we tend to idealize uh, the other women being, uh, you know, the mecca of population. I mean, thinking that the woman is the minority, well, it's not accurate at all. So thinking how women could have positive roles from the point of view of feminine emancipation. And at the same time, in her case, she was an interventionist, not really an annexationist, but an active interventionist. So it is a positive role, you know, and an aggressive attitude. So it was not only pen, but also the sword, you know, with the intervention of the US in the adjacent areas. No, it is fascinating, you know, everything that you just said. Uh, there are two main aspects, which is the political aspect and the commercial aspect, you know, the commercial interests. that she harbored. So actually Mayer has written about this commercial uh, side, you know, that she embraced. This uh, casino uh, part of her, you know, with her second husband. I think that's the, uh, that's the aspect that has been further developed, her expansionist interests with a very important uh, commercial policy you know she has a hypothesis a proposal in one of her articles and it's the fact that she changes you know that's the textual words she changes expansion american expansionist policy from a territorial uh, idea to a commercial idea and this would happen again in the 70s so she started uh, supporting this land, this territory expansionist movement. But during the 60s, it changed the project and the government is going via a more commercial aspects. And I think it is fascinating the way she questions the limits of women in the 19th century, especially in terms of gender. As you very well say, she was the pioneer. She was the first in covering uh, the war between Mexico and the US. She became the first journalist and she was the only journalist, women or men, 
in participating in the war problems between Mexico and the US. So she is against the war and favors the use of diplomacy to reach the expansionist purposes and ends. And she's one of the very few journalistic voices that opposes and becomes a critic of James Faulkner's uh, warlike politics, politics in, in, in against Mexico. So that's why she was given a mission to negotiate peace between both countries. So I find this very interesting. She is the uh, editor of the New York Sun Democratic Review in a time where women presence were, was minimum. And uh, when they are there, they are just limited to translating and to writing novels uh, on demand. And this, it is on, uh, in this context when she decides to do political journalism and economic per, uh, journalism. And there are many articles that have a very strong economic a tin to it that was actually a, an interest of her brother too. According to her biographer, she was an important authority in terms of international policies in the US and in England. And more than 4,000 people would read her Sunday columns in the New York Sun. There was a time, there was a moment where the newspaper was really famous. So she helped, of course, to that, she helped to that result. And it is a very interesting time for journalism because it was expanding and reaching the working class actually. And she was a very good writer was very good in writing for different audiences. There are several articles actually at La Verdad where she targeted the American worker talking about benefits. Now she was, she had that uh, going on for her, you know, the fact that she was able to write to a specific audience. And she was a sort of pioneer in biling bilingual journalism also because she did it in two languages. And she actually published her own newspaper in 1852 when she came back from Texas. At the end of 49, beginning of the 50s, she was accused of breaking neutral laws between the US and Spain because there was a very strong political campaign against Garcia Lopez that was being tried at that time, along with other American uh, people that were in favor of it. So. She went to the border to Texas where she lived her second Texan period in time. So this is the time where she was uh, away from the newspaper and she's reporting from the border. She wrote a book actually on the border, but she continued writing on American newspapers on the federal policies on na Native American uh, citizens. It's critical how the American uh, government is bringing the constant, is concentrating on uh, Native Americans and how critical these policies were. Now, it is a, she is a woman that's constantly moving, that challenges everything having to do with domestic and staying at home. And as you very well say, these are places connected to expansion to the Caribbean imperialism, Texas. Now, correspondence. She uh, exchanged letters with political uh, people, you know, Faulkner, Buchanan. It is not published, right, as an independent text? No, it is just uh, disseminated in the files of these male figures. And to read them, you have to go find them uh, with Faulkner, Bancroft and uh, their mail. So it is very hard to actually find and recover her place in journalism. Could I please ask you to please elaborate a little bit further on her connection with Sullivan and the hypothesis that she may have been 
actually the one that uh, created the concept of the Stino Manifiesto. Yes, of course, it is very interesting. These are the two most iconic representatives of the Young American Movement are the ones that have been visible the most and that have had the largest scope. According to her biographer, Hudson, uh, she used texts that were published with her pseudonym, with Cora Montgomery, and actually this last name was a sort of tribute to an American general that was in the North American Independence Wars. Uh, he also got to Canada, so she used this name to write. So she did a sort of textual analysis using texts that were published with under the name of Sullivan and those under the name of Montgomery. And statistically speaking, the, uh, the computer software that helped her in this uh, effort showed that there is a high uh, probability uh, that it was Montgomery and not Tasno writing the text of annexation. Uh, and the percentage of Sullivan writing it is like 40 something percent, very low compared. So these softwares does a text analysis based on grammar use, style, punctuation, grammar mistakes. And as of that, those, uh, the predictions are well favoring Montgomery than O'Sullivan. Yes, there is a, that's a person that's connected to Cuban annexationists via Madan. Madan is indispensable in order to trace all of this map, you know, this cartography, because his family, he's the brother-in-law. So I think it's going to, uh, he's going to be indispensable, you know, in influencing this US expansionism. And it is this access that will bring them to Cuba. So, if O'Sullivan goes to Havana accompanied by Bish and Casno, well, he, they influenced in some way by Cristóbal Madan. So I think that it's going to be fundamental. He was an indispensable uh, representative, you know? I'm oh, sorry, yes, please go ahead. Uh, could we please, I mean, seizing this opportunity, could you please talk about Casno's visit to Cuba and how afterwards she reflected this in a series of articles that I think were called Tropical Sketches, right? Because you have a previous work on the traveling literature, right? From Americans traveling to Cuba. She was a very a particular traveler uh, along with O'Sullivan and it was a mission not it was not really a pleasure uh, or an entertainment travel or, or visit it was there was a political agenda there so could you please tell us a little bit more about these tropical sketches and how she is a part of the literal literature tradition of the traveling literature Yes, it is very interesting because she's also sort of pioneer because during the 46 and 47, well, the Sisters of Bivar had already done that in Cuba, but it will take 50 years to publish uh, the different uh, books, uh, to, to publish the different books. So in 46, 47, from Cuba, she uh, published these articles uh, in one of the most important newspapers at that time, the New York Sun. So it had a greater reach. There is an explosion, a boom of travelers from the north and from the south coming to Cuba. So they are going to be identified with the annexationism and its expansion. And they also go to Islas Mujeres. They are going to invite Julia and Talib Bird, and it is very interesting because it is a moment where this genre the traveling is changing and these travelers are closer to the tourist than a traveler. Na like natural history and Humboldt, but that's uh, left behind. It is being, it is closer now to the uh, tourist is travelers that, and that's something that they have in common. <clears throat> 
that they are going to render how much in their uh, narratives because they are going to visit places where Narciso Lopez were, was executed. And I find that this is something that predominates the connections, you know, uh, that predominates the connections between the traveling and how they report it in a filibustering way. Now, in her case, it is interesting because today, if you want to read it, well, they haven't been collected as a book. We have to go back to the file to be able to read the articles that she read on Cuba. And Cuba is conceptualized as the blue border, a sort of American uh, Mediterranean uh, that's shared with the slavers. Uh, it is like the Gibraltar of the U.S. And Cuba appears via the Mississippi. This is like a very important connection. The Mississippi favors this integration between Cuba and the American geography. It is very interesting that she's a sort of promoter in the newspaper, but actually she would actually turn into Bremen, the model figure of a woman that came from the US. Bremen is in the US. She visited the US, she came to Cuba and she was the most important reference. When these travelers wanted to visit the Afro-Cuban lobbying, well, it was a sort of justification that could also be reached. So we would have to go back and collect all of Bremen's texts because today they are not incorporated like the Hassa, the Book of Hassa, that published Cuban books and it is read as a Cuban literature effort. With Casno, it's different. It's something that doesn't really fit uh, in, in that canon. Something else that I wanted to ask you I mean, because part of this uh, tradition of this uh, traveling literature, especially the North American, is that basically one of the main topics is plantations. You know, the Cuba of 1840s, 1850s, 60s is the Cuba of the actual plantation boom in Cuba. So 43% of the population was a slave at that time in Cuba. And more than 50 something was a color population. So we're talking about a Cuba that's according to the concepts, according to the concepts is becoming blackened talking about racism rhetorics. So there, among other things, it is because of the massive import, illegal massive import, because slave uh, trafficking was illegal as of 1820. But illegally, more than half a million uh, people between 1820 and 1866, which is the last reported uh, trip, so it was like half a million Africans that were forced to cross the Atlantic towards Cuba and were slaved in plantations, mainly sugar plantations. So uh, Cuba is the background of those trips from America to Cuba, North America to Cuba. And it was a visit to plantations and according to the ideology of the visitor, there were uh, abolitionist notes that many times compare this type of plantation in the US and the type of slavery uh, when it came to sugar plantations. And this was part of a common place, you know, the plantation tour. Do you have any evidence on what was that attitude with respect to Cuba attitude uh, and, and Cuba and the US and Casno and those sketches, those trips, those comics, uh, th those trips. Uh, because there's someone in the chat that actually is asking what was her position in terms of slavery? Laura Pena is asking. Thank you so much for your question, Laura. Well, uh, parenthesis here of the importance of what you just mentioned. 
most of the American travelers that go to Cuba in the 50s and 60s are not only going to turn Bremen into the most important reference, but they're going to repeat the same type of visits that Bremen did to some plantation sites. So it is like a thread, a, a connection, because there was a story before slaves and recovering their lives. So they go to those sites to learn that. So I think the most important text to understand Kasno's position in terms of slavery is the Queen of Islands and the King of Rivers. It is a text that has two parts in it. The second part is for Mississippi, and she uses a, a trip as an excuse from Texas to New York. And she uses that trip as an excuse to pro to talk about slavery, taking into account the abolitionist uh, and the slavery states. If I had to sum up her position, I would say that she would favor the abolition, a gradual and eventual abolition of slavery. And according to her, it was being carried out in the U.S. from north to south, actually, and it would favor uh, I mean, Cuba annexation incorporation as part of the U.S. territory would expand that southern uh, border in the U.S. in order to relocate Afro-descending populations. And she was in favor of colonizing Afro-descending population to Cuba and to the U.S. So she was very clever working with the different type of audiences, North, South. I mean, North audience was the main target. Uh, and she made Cuban annexation as an abolitionist topic with them. The only way to abolish slavery in the US, she would say, in Cuba and all of the empire was annexing Cuba incorporating Cuba because in that way the illegal slave trafficking would be eliminated. So it was the Spanish colonialism with preserving slavery and what she was talking about illegal trafficking, illegal slave trafficking. So she was very critical of slavery or the semi-servant type of style from Yucatecan to the island and she really criticized this type of slavery. The, like trafficking Yucatecans to there. And uh, you realize then that uh, in Cuba and Puerto Rico, it was a humanitarian uh, situation. It was a controversial aspect where there is a radical abolition movement and she plays a role be, because with the south it doesn't really fit either because it is frowned upon so it was a very controversial position the one that she had when she addresses the pro slavers of the south that opposed cuban vision because supposedly it was going to ruin their sugar industry she argued that we, if they stopped the illegal slave traffic in Cuba was going to affect it. So the Southerns were going to be in worse conditions to compete against the sugar, the Cuban sugar market and industry. So she was a multimedia, so to speak, abolitionist in the gradual abolition of this different states and colonizing Afro-descending uh, population to Cuba and Africa. Very interesting and yes, controversial. There is also another person, Agustin de Jesus, that asks, who financed, who funded La Verdad from La Habana, from Havana? And I think that this kind of interrelates with what you were trying to say. I think, but I don't want to get ahead of myself, it was financed by powerful slaver groups in Havana, right? The Alfonso Aldama, Madam Clan, right? That at that time were probably one of the top 10 most powerful owners of slaves in Cuba. All of the families have 40 more or less of them. And at the same time, <clears throat> 
it is controversial. There were 40 sugar deals and they also had Spanish noble titles, but so this origin, this, this original group, did they fund La Verdad? Do you think that Casno received a salary? And if such, how could it be considered as a part of La Verdad? Yes, I think that she became the main editor of the newspaper because she was receiving a salary. She wrote in exchange of money. That's actually a well-known, her biographer recorded that actually. And as you have said, it was a newspaper financed from the Habana by plantation owners. And Emily, one of the historians, the one that came closer to this vision, would distinguish between a patriotic annexationism and a commercial annexationism. In the Patriot one, well, we had Betancourt, Cisneros, everyone that was also uh, receiving a salary. And the commercial annexationism was one with a slaver interest, evidently. So it was like a sort of excision between one group and another. The group of the plantation owners would finance uh, the book from uh, the newspaper from the Habana. And actually I found a note, a journalistic note with uh, written by Casno, showing their sympathy to the, how she favored the expansionism. It was an anti trafficking, anti-illegal trafficking, because Casno was against it, but there's no clear statement in favor of slavery abolition. But that's a small note that I wrote from her. And the interesting thing is that, uh, well, yes, these funds are used, but El Mulato, that there's a newspaper in 1848, 44, sorry, also saw her as a collaborator. It had a more inclusive vision of Cuban nationality and she became a collaborator of that new newspaper. So it helps us think about this excision between one group and another. That's what I would say to answer this question. I think that now I'm gonna pass the floor to Tania Bruguera. Tania. As a moderator, are you going to read the questions from the audience? Yes, actually, there is a question that you already read. Who funded, who financed La Verdad from Havana? And if there is any consequence in Cuba and Puerto Rico because of the newspaper's rhetoric. So what was the impact of all of this effort? There are many questions and all of them are amazing. So maybe I can read two of them. Uh, or you wanna go one by one or as you wish. There's another question, which is, well, a person that's thanking you for your very interesting presentation. And the question is, is there any evidence of interactions with or exchanges between Cora and Jose Martin? Well, thank you so much for your questions. Well, as far as I've read, no. I don't think that there was an interaction between Casno. Well, no, because Martí is 1853. And by the time Martí lived in New York, she died in 78, right? Yes, but she was est estranged from the New York life. She lived in Dominican Republic at that time. I think that maybe with the Cuban figure that she connected the most is with Emilia Casanova de Villaverde. <laughs> because of many reasons, because they are in the same time and place in New York. 
and there's evidence that Emilia Casanova read La Verdad from Cuba. So we only know <clears throat> because of the biography that she wrote. And it's quite clear because the reading of these newspapers that do not really mention the name, but the newspapers that were done uh, from New York is La Verdad, the most important. They are connected with political calling that Emilia had. So I'm sure that there's this a interrelationship between these two interesting uh, people. The two of them were lobbyists at the US Congress. Casanova was lobbying to recognize the importance of the Cuban and their right to belligerence. And they had, there were meetings with Grant. And something that brought them together is the letters the letters became a means to carry out this sort of lobbying actually she internationalized the independence wars because when she writes to victor hugo and garibaldi uh, finding for sympathy looking for sympathy garibaldi via silo via verde and this is very interesting because it is a biography that considers the public part of it the way casanova's life is organized is following the public aspect, then also the private one. But mainly, this is the public dimension uh, that is addressed from Casanova. And then we have the letters. And this letter exchange is including Gomez, Quesada. So during the 70s, the figure that in some way <clears throat> organizes the connection between New York and the independent members of Cuba was by Emilia Casanova Villaverde. That was, so there is a very interesting story that she wrote to the, his, her, her, her son in order to recognize the Cuban's belligerency. And she sums up situations that are indispensable for Casanova. She was a very pragmatic woman. But of course, she is asking for Villaverde's help to write it down. And she tells the son, tell your father, these are the items that have to be addressed. I don't want a novel here. I'm not aiming for a novel here. So the relationship Villaverde-Casanova-Casanova was very pragmatic. And Villaverde was behind the scenes helping with the texts that she wanted to present, but she didn't want them for, the, for, to, for them to be all wordy and rhetoric. No, to the point and specific. So you could see like a continuity here that was very interesting and the first question sorry was about la verdad well from uh, the newspaper was censored actually and what happened many times is that there were letters published from cuba and these letters give you an idea that it is read throughout the island so i we don't really know if that's true throughout the island we don't really know if that's true but uh, La Verdad would reach ships and, well, that's actually something that we could think of, right? That we could keep on in researching. I wonder if in any of her tri uh, trips to Cuba, was there any relationship with the independent fighters that were against the annexationism? And if there is anything known about this encounter, and if it influenced her, maybe talking about Casno or Casanova? No, Cora, Cora, yes, Cora. Well, I don't think so because independent wars during the 68, when they were exploded, they still have election, uh, electionism there. You know, the idea was becoming incorporated into the US. And afterwards, they said that was radicalized and they became into anti-slavery movements because all of the slavery a situation is still uh, considering to be part of these two years of war. And then the slavery was radicalized in, in turning into independence and abolishing slavery. Here we also have Ingrid Brioso. And there's another aspect. She talked about the esclavism and all that. And 
you already talked about the Louisiana uh, contract and also mentions how you already talked about William Crete and then, well, that has already been answered. But she says something that uh, relates to Tani's question that has to do with gen gender. Uh, I find it interesting how even pa the painting that you show brings kind of masculinized features, you know, like masculine features. And she says that I am interested uh, on the image that you showed at the beginning where Cora appears with male kind of features, very different to the uh, representation. So the uh, paintings of other women later on, even Emilia Casanova herself. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because it is fascinating how she broke the social gender norms and standards and at the same time with a conservative uh, aspect of her, you know, because she also had one and it is basic for this conversation. And the second question is about her role as a filibuster. Ingrid is saying that filibuster occupies positions of extra legality outside of the legality, but at the same time, this imaginarium acquired a romantic notion in most recent decades. So how do you approach her uh, representation as a filibuster? Well, thank you so much, Tanya, and thank you so much for your questions. Now, about the portrait. Well, what I can tell you about the masculine comment is that her texts on her travels to Dominican Republic, although we would have to question if they are actually as a travel because she lived there for a long time, she wrote them using the voice of a man. So she speaks as if she was a man. So it is very hard, actually, so think about the female writing and the features that would be covered by that type of entity in the writing effort. So yes, it was a type of filibustering. When she writes in La Verdad, she uh, compares the pen with the sword and she talks about the sort of uh, synchrony, you know, uh, and the expectations and the Cuban are already pulling out their swords. So she addresses that as a filibusterism between uh, pen and sword. And the other questions I think have already been answered. Marielle, do you have any other question? that you would like to address? I think that this is just fascinating. Thank you so much, Dailet, for introducing me to this character, this woman. She also had uh, an end of life uh, that was actually a, a culmination of all of the uh, situations that she experienced, right? Because actually, it was very dramatic. She died during a ship a shipwreck that made it to the headlines of uh, of the newspapers. So, a proposal is it would be very interesting to also include Emilia Casanova. And Casno, maybe publishing their letter exchange, what they also sent to the uh, North American government in a sort of reading on two women that broke the mold uh, and the standards of women that had to be wives and housewives, but two women that had political careers that overlapped but well, Emilia was a little bit younger, but either way in New York, uh, La Verdad brought them together and the nectionism. So I think it would be very interesting to consider them under the light of the same text. That's something that would be very interesting to do. 
and I insist I've been working in slave trafficking. So I insist that there is a, a, a background, you know, that we haven't addressed that much during this conversation. But behind all of it, we have slavery, right? Because the civil war wouldn't a conflict that divided the US based on defending slavery by the South and abolishing the slavery from the North. So when you see the arguments of the uh, abolition, well, it, the, it was kind of racist, you know, even the abolition effort because they were talking about blackening the communication, uh, the community, sorry. And it was just send them sending them back to Africa or to Iberia. So uh, it was actually uh, created as an American colonization society effort. So the idea of incorporating, of annexating to Cuba or Dominican Republic or Haiti was also part of this project, like to export Afro North American population. Uh, they may, of course, not sending it back to sending them back to Africa because it's far away, but sending them maybe to Cuba or or, or Dominican Republic. I mean, it is a fascinating aspect, you know. As a woman, she broke all of the standards, all of the social norms of the gender. As a politician, where well, she was in the border between defending slavery and a gradual uh, or eventual abolition. So I think it would be worthwhile to have a book from Cuba's point of view, because I was looking at the book more or less, and she's unaware of Cuba history so maybe you could seriously contribute uh, to the story of this fascinating woman yes my hypothesis to the south is that it turns into a problem that's evidently southern it started with the north the northerns are the first one that starts the debate but very soon the South also owned the annexationism as a, an option. So it's so replaced Narciso Lopez as a filibuster. So once this happens and acquires a Southern element, then, well, she was a, nation, a, a nationalistic person, right? So she would uh, look to Dominican Republic where slavery had already been abolished and there were less tensions in this sense. But that's kind of my hypothesis that as of there, she turned to Cuba also. Well, we would like to thank Professor Mariel Iglesias for helping us in this project today, for supporting us and helping us have a fascinating conversation with Dilette Dominguez. Thank you so much, Dilette. And I can just ask you to please remember to go back to Dr. Class Calendar to look at other events. And I truly recommend our YouTube channel. And I recommend it because I follow it and I found fascinating things that have been discussed in Cuban studies or in general, classes in general, our other class YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dilet, once again. Thank you so much for this fascinating topic and for opening us up more to another aspect of our uh, history. So until the next one, have a great day.